Will you pray with me, please? Holy God, we thank you once more for this opportunity you have given us this day to come here into your presence, to hear your word proclaimed once more, and to seek to know you a little more in our lives. So speak to us this day, O God, for we are listening. In Christ's name we pray, Amen. Amen. Well, all you need to do is turn on the news, surf the internet for just a minute, or read through our prayer list each week, and you will see that bad things still happen to good people, tyrants still rule in most of the world, and maybe soon here, and that accidents, both human and natural, take countless innocent lives and illness and disease countless millions more. And ultimately, someone is going to ask the question, why? Why did this happen? Why did they have to die? Why did they have to suffer so much? And I've noticed that the questioning of why is often relative to the situation. When my 92-year-old father died, no one really asked me the big why question. For it seems natural for someone who lived for 92 years, should die. So instead of why, I heard a lot of, well, at least he had a nice long life. Which is actually true. He did have a nice long life. But it misses the point that my father was actually in pretty good health and may be alive today if he hadn't slipped on some ice and hit his head. For that's what killed him, not his age. So in my family, especially my mother, the why question was and still a- is still asked. And in general, it seems that the younger people die, the more apt we are to ask the question why. You know, an 80-year-old woman dies and we think, well, that's too bad. She probably had a few good years left in her. You know, a 70-year-old dies and we think, whoa, that's hitting a little close to home now. For 70, he's not that old. A 50-year-old dies. And we think, okay, that really is too young. Why did that happen to someone supposedly entering into this mythical golden years of life? And 40 and 30 and 20, same reaction. Why? And my goodness, if a child dies, right? Then we just don't ask the question, we scream it. Why? Why, God, would you let this happen? Why, God, would you let this happen? For that's really what we want to know, isn't it? Why, God, did you let this happen? How could you let a child suffer and die like that? I mean, how could you let a mentally ill teenager kill 30 of his high school classmates? How could you let a plane crash into buildings, killing thousands of innocent people? You know, why, God, why did you allow all these things to happen? Is it because on a national level, we are more concerned with border control and ending food stamps and closing down shelters than we are with finding ways to enact peace and kindness and gentleness? Those things defined as being the fruits of your spirit? good Christian nation that we are? Well, how about at a personal level? Do these things happen because 
we're not living right. So instead of the spirit of life, God decides to send, send down the spirit of death upon you. And how does God decide that? Well, how do we decide, actually? I mean, do we praise God for smiting the abusive father who sexually molests his own children? I mean, if God were going to take someone's life, that sounds like a pretty good place to start, right? Well, what about the habitual liar who causes havoc well beyond the walls of their own home? Should God start smiting all the liars in the world? And if so, which lies are deserving of death and which ones can we skim by on? I mean, can you imagine this scene at a funeral home with family members and friends screaming out, Why, God? It was just a little white lie. You didn't have to kill him. It's relative, isn't it? I mean, little children shouldn't die ever, right? Rapists and murderists, well, they should die always. And old men and women... Well, I guess that one's up in the air, right? Well, is that really how we want God to act? And is that how we really want to understand God? When the disciples asked Jesus why, why did Pilate go and kill some people in this gruesome way we had in the gospel? And why did the tower fall on some people but apparently missed others and killed some but not everyone? Was it because they were sinners? And therefore the tower knew just which way to fall and upon whom to fall? Or that Pilate knew just which ones to pick out of the crowd and kill or, or cared? When the disciples asked Jesus why... He doesn't answer them directly. Instead, he seems to say to them, look, that is a bad, bad question to ask. You know, to ask why when someone dies. It's just going to lead you to despair, frustration, or depression. I mean, it's a bad question to ask because you're not going to get the answer. I mean, to ask why did the five-year-old die in that car accident? Yeah. Why was the mentally ill person allowed to purchase a gun and shoot up an entire school and then expect God to be responsible for that? I mean, does God really control the brakes and steering wheels of everyone's car? Is God in charge of passing gun control laws? or how we provide health care to the mentally ill? Those are our ways. And our ways are not God's ways. And God's ways are not our ways. You know, God's wisdom, God's care, God's providence is like a great ocean. And our knowledge of God's ways is like a single drop in that bucket. I mean, think about it. The entirety of Holy Scripture, the Bible, Old Testament and New, adds up to just over 31,000 verses. Sounds like a lot. 31,000 sentences. But it's not. It only makes a book that big. And we think we have the right to question God? Well, actually, I do think we have the right to question God and to cry out to God with our questions when we are in despair. What I do not think is all right is to demand an answer. Especially since we've already come up with the answer and what we're really demanding of God is that God confess to us, yes, you're right, I have been mismanaging the universe and what happened should never have happened. Forgive me for being a lazy and unattentive God. I mean, do you see where this can lead? And how, unfortunately, it often does? I can fall into that trap, too. So what are we left with? 
Well, we're left with a different question. Instead of questioning God and insisting that our ways should be God's ways, listen to how Jesus answers his disciples when they say, Lord, do you think they died because they were worse sinners than everyone else? Jesus says, no. But if you do not repent, you will perish as they did. Well, Lord, do you think the tower fell on them because they were worse than everybody else? Jesus says, no. But if you don't repent, you're going to perish like they did. Which when I read that, I'm like, what? (laughs) Repent or perish? I mean, is Jesus really answering the cries of our hearts with repent or perish? I mean, that doesn't sound very comforting. I thought Jesus was supposed to comfort us. So what's up with that? Well, I'll tell you. What Jesus is reminding us of is that we all die. There's no getting around that. Death has had a 100% success rate in human history. So if you want to spend your whole life debating all the different ways people can die and which ones you think are okay and which ones are not, which ones were fair, which ones weren't, then you're going to have a miserable life and you might just miss out on the great blessings God does have in store for you. And there is an urgency in Jesus' message. I mean, for life, if life really is fleeting and the next drunk driver or or actually more likely nowadays the next texting driver may be the untimely cause of your death this afternoon then are you ready is what Jesus is asking are you ready have you made decisions to do more good than bad and have you actually begun to act upon them? In other words, are we bearing the good fruits of the Spirit or are we not? Are we showing kindness and gentleness toward everyone or are we harboring ill feelings and resentments towards some? We all have our favorite resentments, right? When Jesus says repent or perish, he's not saying that if you repent, you're not going to die. What he is saying, that is if you turn your life more toward God's ways than your own, then you will not perish into the flames of hatred, jealousy, and fits of rage. You know, the word repent shows up in the Bible plenty. But maybe not one we carefully think about very often. In fact, I think most of us avoid thinking about it because it conjures up a not-so-long-ago era of fire and brimstone preaching that cast you more as being made in the image of the devil instead of the image of God. All until you repent, that is, then all is well. You know, repentance, by the basic definition of the word, simply means to turn around. In fact, in the early church, before people were baptized, they would literally turn their bodies as they made their baptismal vows. They would renounce Satan and all ways of evil facing the West, where darkness and despair loomed. And then they would turn their bodies toward the East, toward the sun where light comes from and confess their faith in Jesus Christ and be plunged into baptism. But here in Luke's gospel, when he uses the word repent, he not only means to turn around, but to turn and look at the world in a new way. You know, repentance as a changed mind, as a willingness to adopt a new perspective, I mean, yes, it is turning for sure, but then you need to reorient, it, reorient your life once you have turned. 
I mean, if you were once walking along life in this direction, you know, thinking you're a pretty good person, and actually most people would agree with that, but you haven't forgiven your mother, who was less than motherly to you some 40 years ago, well, just because you turn around and start walking in that direction doesn't mean you've given up that resentment. You're just walking that way instead of this one without having let go of our resentments. Those good ones, we like to hold on to, the justifiable resentments. Which, by holding on to them, actually does make it easier for us to want to debate God about the fairness of life than to take the responsibility for our own. Well, I can imagine some of you saying, or at least thinking right now, gee, Pastor, this is pretty much but a bit of a bummer of a sermon this morning. You got any good news for us? Well, yes, I do. I do. And it starts by telling you you are not made in the image of the devil, but rather each and every one of you has been made in the image of God. And while we may not know God's ways, each and every one of us benefits from God's ways. For just as surely someday this life will come to an end, our faith will conquer death and darkness just as Jesus did when he was led to his own death on the cross. And so the only thing left to do then is to ask, are you ready? Are you living a life of joy and peace and kindness, and goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control? Look it up, Galatians 5, by the way the fruits of the Spirit. Or, like me, do you have a little more work to do on some of those things? Well, fear not. For I think if you put your heart and your mind and your soul in the right direction, then you're going to be all right. I mean, God's not going to chop you down because you haven't quite forgiven someone yet. I mean, think about it. If credit card companies are willing to give you a little extra time to pay your bill before ruining your credit score, don't you think God can do even more for the rest of our lives? And what do they call that extra time, by the way? A grace period. And that's what this whole morning has been about. Grace. God's grace that is forever poured out in your direction, you just need to step into it. God's grace that says, no, don't chop down the fig tree yet. Give it another year. And I'll send my son to care for it, to nurture it, to wrap you in his arms when you're cold and to look up in the sky with you when it's warm. And when time finally does end, it will be the grace of God that brings you home forever. So friends, let me close by saying that I pray that each and every one of us will realize the unfettered grace of God in our lives, and may we all walk our closer walk with the one who brings peace and joy to all the days of our lives. Amen. 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 Will you pray with me, please? Holy God, your love is patient and kind. Give us the courage to be kind to others and to serve with patience those who are so often unkind, rude, difficult to love, or even ones we label our enemies. For they are your children and our sisters and brothers, and they too were made in your image. Holy God, your love is truthful. 
So give us the insight to speak the truth in love and for the sake of your kingdom and not out of a need to appear clever or right. Your love, God, is not quick-tempered. So we pray for those who are angry and violent and for their victims, for children who fear, elders who are abused, and people trapped in relationships that injure and harm. For God, your love bears all things. And we remember before you those with heavy burdens, many cares and much stress, and too little comfort and help. Allow them to seek their comfort in your holy arms, which never fail to reach out and hold on to us. For even death, does not trespass on the breadth and depth of your love. And so we thank you for those we have loved in this life and who now dwell in the peace and joy of your presence. Comfort those who are bereaved this day and bring us all closer to the one who is peace and in whose name we pray, Jesus Christ. Amen.